I got a microphone. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody here this morning, first Sunday of November, and um, uh, the um, the weather changing and all. It's been. A, it's, I hope you've been able to enjoy the weekend and enjoyed a little bit of Halloween last night. Just turn to the back of the bulletin real quick. Three little quick announcements. Um, tonight at 5 o'clock upstairs in the third floor in a big room up there that we're calling the Spontaneous Theater. Um, we're setting up for the Improv First Group to do a little comedy and hope that you all can come and join. We'll have refreshments. It's free. It's going to be about 45 minutes, if that long, but it'll be a fun time to get together and just visit some. But the group, the about 20 people, got some fun stuff planned, so we hope you can be there for that. And that's at 5 o'clock this evening. And then uh, uh, Lynn Deloney is leading a, a book study group that's a follow-up to what we've been doing in here, but it's more in-depth. Uh, you can read about it there to give everyone a chance to sort of dig deeper into this. There's two opportunities if you want to participate in either of these book study groups. And then on Monday, we continue with our wine and wishful thinking. If you're visiting with us, make sure, especially first time, that you pick up a CD from our band, some of their music back here afterwards, and also we're glad that you're with us. Also, everyone else, register your attendance while we're sitting here, and we'll get started. Turns out they need me for this first one. <laughs> this morning, we finish up our final Sunday in the series of, of um, falling upward, or the spirituality of falling. This is one of uh, my favorite songs as well. Grew up and was weaned on this guy. To learn how to fall Or you learn to fly And mama, mama It ain't no lie Before you learn to fly Learn how to fall to drift in the breeze before you set your sails it's an occupation where the wind prevails before you set your sails drift in the breeze Nobody's got the runs for glory. Nobody stop and scrutinize the plan. Nobody ever stops and scrutinizes the plan. Nobody stop and never scrutinize the plan. You got to learn how to fall, or you learn to fly. Towns where they tell no lie before you learn to fly, learn how to fall. got to learn how to fall. Before you learn how to fly, you got to learn how to fall. So this morning, we think a little bit about what it means to fall upward, in the sense that falling is really flying, and flying is really falling. Let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. 
Holy One, as we gather this morning, we are grateful for this chance to be together in community. We are grateful for this chance to be together one with another. Open us as we seek what it means to be connected to you, to connected to one another, and to all of life in the midst of your creation, in the midst of your reality. We give thanks in the name of the one in whom we move and live and have our being. Amen. So this morning, we haven't done this in a while. You picked a great day to be here. We're going to dance. Oh, I don't hear any moaning. I, there used to be, I don't know, there used to be a couple of folks that would come up to me afterwards and would say, if you ever do this again, tell me before Sunday. But we're going to go ahead and have some fun and take a little bit of risk and take some hands, and I just need some volunteers around the table. Now, this is pretty simple. This is pretty simple. It's just, uh, let's quiet down just a little bit. This is um, basically grapevining it. We start to the right, and we sing, Come now, holy water, come and heal our, our earth. Mayim, Mayim, okay? And then we turn the other direction to sing the next line. Oh, wait, I sang the wrong one. Yeah. That's their song. We're doing Shalom. Okay. So we go the other way and we say Shalom, Havarim, Shalom, Havarim, Shalom, Shalom. And then we do this. You ready? God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. Shalom, Shalom. And you know what Shalom means? It means peace. Shalom, bring peace. And I've got this wonderful echo. All right, we're going to start slow. All right, here we go. You ready, band? To the right. To the right. Shalom, Havarim. Shalom, Shalom. And the peace. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. Shalom, Shalom. Take hands. Other way. Shalom, Havarim. Shalom, Havarim. Shalom, Shalom. God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. Shalom. Shalom. All right, very good. Now, I encourage you to do the grapevine, right in front of left, left in front of right, back and forth. It gets the brain working, you know, because both sides of the brain have to work. Don't just sort of go and zip it back and forth. Try that grapevine. Allow people to hold you up as you stumble and fall. That's part of what this morning's all about. And we'll speed it up just a little bit. Here we go. Here we go. Shalom, Havadim, Shalom, Havadim, Shalom, Shalom. God's peace be with you, God's peace be with you, Shalom. To the left. Shalom, Shalom, Havadim, Shalom, Havadim, Shalom, Shalom. God's peace be with you, God's peace be with you, Shalom, Shalom. So I find this interesting in improv, we have this wonderful exercise where we don't actually call each other's name. We just look at one another and we look for someone who's looking back. And as they look back, we lock eyes and that's who we respond to. So um, I notice that sometimes we turn and we're looking at somebody's back. So look for somebody's <laughs> eyes and just, and just respond to that. A little bit faster, I think. We're a little risky here. Here we go, to the right. And Shalom, Havad, Shalom, Havad, Shalom, Shalom. God's peace be with you, God's peace be with you, Shalom to the Lord. Shalom, Havad, Shalom, Havad, Shalom, Shalom. God's peace be with you, God's peace be with you, Shalom. One more time, Lord, I say, Shalom, Havad, Shalom, Havad, Shalom. God's peace be with you, Shalom. Last time, to the left. Shalom, Havadim, Shalom, Havadim, Shalom, Shalom. God's peace be with you, God's peace be with you, Shalom, Shalom. All right, good job. Take a moment, greet one another with signs of peace. <laughs>
nice job on that. Hey, um, of course, I forgot to ask people to come forward with their offerings and registration, but that's all right. We'll figure out where to do that a little bit later on, so don't worry. You don't get out of here without doing a little letting go. Uh, listen, we have a very special announcement this morning that is being provided by our Improv First on um, flying. F-E-A-R, future events appear real. Do you suffer fear of flying, fear of falling, fear of failing? Are you anxious about tomorrow, Res regretful about something that happened yesterday? Are you still thinking about that date who dumped you right before the prom? 25 years ago. Today, there is hope. Present Moment Pharmaceuticals presents the now. Now, there is nothing to worry about. Right now, nothing you are afraid of is happening. Staying in the present moments now, there is nothing to regret. There is only now. Side effects of being in the now can include a general prolonged sense of contentment and well-being. Improved relationships with family members. Feeling the need to forgive irritating relatives. Loss of worry about the future. Smile at st smiling at strangers and random act of kindness. And recurring impulses to catch a blue boat home. Present moments now may cause acne to clear up, crow's feet to disappear, and balding people may experience new hair growth. If none of that happens, be in the now and you won't mind. <laughs> Brought to you by Present Moment Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> there exists only that present instant, a now which always and without end is itself new. There is no yesterday nor any tomorrow but only now, as it was a thousand years ago, and as it will be a thousand years hence. My Sir Eckhart. Would you sing with us, please? If I were to pray, if I were to Breaking of the morning, the dying of the day. What would I say? What would I say? What would my heart speak if I were to pray? And if I were to sing, if I were my soul could give some honest offering. What would I bring? What would I bring? What are the simple truths my soul would want to say? And if I do sacred light that all creation turned to live and hear. Will not my song throughout the cosmos ring and swim that crystal river that flows through every
What would my heart speak if I were to pray? So I invite you to join with me as we listen to the singing bowl, as we just listen to the ring of the tone. Just whatever, however you like to relax and get into that quiet space, it's our Kairos time, our time to be very present, uh, to be now. So I just invite you to take breaths and allow the sound of the bowl to focus your attention away from everything else. This is our time to allow all of the other experiences of the week, of the day, to come in the afternoon. The week ahead, all of that is no longer present. Just this moment, the sounds and our breath together. And as we inhale and exhale, we are sharing the breaths with one another the oxygen and breathing that has been present for days and years and centuries, still present, still upholding us, even as we uphold it. Meister Eckhart once said that if all we can think of saying is thank you, that prayer alone is enough. Amen. He was a walk the wall. They called him the chief because he was Indian. It was the name they said behind his back. In the summer he'd march without any shoes until the soles of his feet turned black. Till the soles of his feet turned black. And his hands wouldn't work the machinery. His brain told him what to say. It's a hell of a life, but it's somebody's life. Up and down the street all day. Places like a dog running on a track. The wheels keep on going as fast as you get there. You don't ever get to go back. I don't really know what I'm doing. Just watching myself in some play. And the actress looks like she wants to go home and lie in a bed all day. Yeah, lie in a big bed all day. His hands wouldn't work the machinery. His brain told him what to say. It's a hell of a life, but it's somebody's life Up and down the street all day Well, I wish that you could see me when I'm flying my 
We're waiting on Tom, I think. Well, in the meantime, how's everybody doing? <laughs> this is the part where we take requests. <laughs> I'm sure he'll just be a second or two. His office is right there. And now we have Lynn's Reverend way more better at this. Zen Lynn, my friends. Yeah, right. Let's give that for Mr. Lynn. Just a quick politi uh, political service commitment. Um, this Wednesday and this Sunday, we will begin a new class that's just going to go through November. And it's on this theme of falling upward. Uh, those who are interested can be reading the book or parts of the book. We're not even going to get that much into it. But the early part of the book by Richard Rohr. But a big part of it is going to be bringing yourself and in whatever ways, stories that relate to your own experience, if you would like to, that can be part of the circle of trust. And we'll have ways of beginning each, each time that kind of emphasize uh, this is a sacred space and a time together, so it's not just quick conversation, that people have time for their souls to show up. So that's what it's going to be about. I've already just oh, talked to somebody. I said, which one are you going to go to, Wednesday or, or uh, Sunday? He said, both, which is okay if you want to show up because it's not going to be repetition of the same material because it's about reflecting on that material related to your own life. It's kind of improvisational living, and it's uh, and however it shows up. Anyway, that's my, is Tom here yet? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what he was going to say. <laughs> no, uh, really, this theme, I, I noticed the, the song, the very first one, is called... <laughs> Hello, Tom. Calling Tom. So, so here's my question. Did you guys fill in while I was absent, or did you stare at each other for a minute? I was just kind of curious how that would happen, since I didn't have a chance to tell everybody that um, in the middle of that, my technology shut down. So, it said it was working, but the sermon never came up. I ran upstairs to print my sermon, which, of course, I have the slowest printer in the universe, so thank you and my apologies. Um, but that gave you a moment to decide whether or not you wanted to stay. <laughs> Would have been a good time to leave. So um, my son and I, I don't know if, or my, my wife and I, and I don't know if you guys did this. Did you all participate in Halloween last, week, last night? Everybody in costume? We gave up candy. No. Gave up candy? <laughs> I didn't get any trick or treater. Oh, no, no. Well, <laughs> um, where, where is uh, David? David um, told me, David Smoot told me a wonderful story. I'm going to go ahead and share it. He said in his neighborhood, which I guess over here off of, uh, off of 7th Street in that area over in, in, uh, off Camp Bowie and 7th Street, uh, there was one house where the, the, they were giving away toothbrushes. <laughs> he said he wished he'd had a camera just to see the expression of children's faces <laughs> when they were handed toothbrushes. Um, I, on the other hand, I, on the other hand, I went with uh, my wife over to the Magnolia area, over to the Paramount area, where my kids live, where, and where um, 
uh, Michael and Stan live, and they have a great house, and so on the porch, you know, everybody's out on their porches. Uh, and so we dressed up in this. Can, can you pull it up there? There we are. <laughs> that's actually not Linda, but that's a kid that walked up all of a sudden. I put on that mask, and my mother looked up from the candy bag and saw this. And then I remembered Michael said, she's 88 years old. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have, like, startled her. <laughs> but we had a great time. And what was interesting is we were giving out candy. Of course, the kids come up. And there, were, there was this one kid who was in a Darth Vader costume. And he was probably four years old. And he came up on the steps. His parents were down the sidewalk watching him. He had the mask on and everything. And, and it was we're three steps up to the porch, so you have to literally want to come get the candy, right? Because you got to walk on the porch, you got to walk by this guy, and, and then get to the, the older lady who's got the basket of candy. And so this kid comes up, and he's a little tenuous at the steps. Uh, the mask, I'm sure, is difficult. He steps up onto the porch, and he's got his beeline. He's got the eyes focused on the, can on the prize. So he's walking over, and he gets up a couple of handfuls of, or just a handful of candy. He turns around and starts back to the step, which is when he notices that. He notices this guy with the pointed head and the shaggy hair, and he just kind of freezes. Unfortunately, he froze with his foot out. But he hasn't taken a step yet. He's in this midpoint of what's going on, what's happened here. And he hears somebody, it's his mom or his dad, says, look out where you're going. And so that's when he kind of focuses back again, and he starts to step down. I mean, it's a little tenuous for a little four-year-old in a costume with a Darth Vader mask on. And as he's stepping down, something suddenly catches attention. I guess he's wondering if he got the candy after all, because now he's looking up like he's trying to see his hand while he's stepping onto the, onto the bottom step. And he takes that left foot and starts to step forward as he's looking at his hand. And clearly, this kid has no sense of where he's going, only what he's looking at. And that's when someone else shouts, look out, to which he turns and falls on the sidewalk. And, of course, there's the screaming and there's crying, and he's fine, and he's a little bruised. But the most important thing is, is he looks up and he's still got his candy. <laughs> and he starts to walk off. And... And I was thinking, you know, the, the, what Richard Rohr says is that when we fall, where we're looking isn't always the issue. Oftentimes, it's where we're not looking. Fear finds its power, he says, in not looking, and even more so in looking away. So over the week, as I was doing some research and studying on this, I found this, this site called The Forgiveness Project. And it was initiated in, in the UK, uh, but it's all over the world now. One of the early people involved with this was a woman by the name of Marion Partington. And she lives in the UK, and, and she, her book just came out a couple of years ago, which is entitled, I Sit Very Still. I'm sorry, If You Sit Very Still. And, and in, this, in the book, she tells the story of how her sister Lucy had disappeared at the age of 21. It was back in the late, mid, late 70s. And she was on her way to a night class and disappeared. And for 20 years, they lived with this sense of horror, not knowing what had happened, and just this vague numbness, right, to this new reality that is just numb and, and dark. And then in, in the mid-1990s, they found her body. And, it, of course, it, it was buried in the basement of some house that wasn't in, too far away in another community. And that, in fact, it had been a serial killer that they had been looking for for some time. And that actually led to... They're finding the serial killer, a couple. The, 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 the story that ensued was just this cruel, ambivalent coldness that actually made, seemed to make things worse for Marion and for her family, but particularly for Marion because she was close to her younger sister. And she found herself needing to get away. She, she, just, she decided that I just need to be somewhere privately. But the problem with that was is as she pursued this private retreat, she began to discover that the nightmares that she continued to experience, the visions, the scenes over and over, they only created in her a deeper sense of, of murderous revenge. She couldn't let go of this sense of just deep, dark revenge. But she had the sense about her, the, the, perhaps the, the consciousness about her, to say, if I, if I continue with this, not only will it destroy me eventually, 
but it will certainly destroy everyone with whom I have contact. The same terror, the same revenge, the same deep hatred that wells in me is going to find its way out in every relationship I have and with my children, and it will continue. And so she decided to do something radical, she said. She just sat with it. She went on a second retreat and sat with it. She said that at some point, she entered with it. She wrestled with it. Uh, uh, Brene Brown came out with a new book recently. Uh, Lynn and I have been talking back and forth about it. I don't, you, you know about Brene Brown and all of her research with vulnerability and on the TED Talks that are so famous for her coming out and just sharing this vulnerability and how powerful and profound that experience is. Well, she wrote a new book called Rising Strong, and it's really a, it's a good book. I've only glanced at it, but I'm going to, I'm going to dive into it. She, she talks about how to face those deep disasters, those deep crises, those deep darknesses within us, whether it's shame or, or loss or pain or suffering or illness. She talks about how to face that. And, and one of the things she says is that you have to face the darkness with curiosity, which I think is an interesting idea. You have to face, you have to be willing to enter it with curiosity. She said, that's exactly what Marion said she did. She said, I entered it, I wrestled with it, and then she says, I created with it. And eventually, she writes, I discovered that in my sister's murderers was a sense of myself and remarkably a sense of their own humanity. And she began to define, redefine words instead of forgiveness because that seems still like something I have to do for someone else. She defined the term forgive, forgiveness, the way life is and the way we live it with one another, and that it's given for in as much as it's a givenness. So she learned how to live with this in a way that allowed the pain, but at the same time engaged it. And as a consequence, she was one of those early people to work with the Forgiveness Project and continues to work with that, which works with victims and, and, the, and the criminals. Richard Rohr said that fear often gets its power from not looking or from looking away too hard, which we might think of as running, whether it's a big loss or a sudden loss of a loved one or a divorce or a diagnosis of cancer or simply a small kind of darkness that we face all the time in our relationships with others, at staff or in family, and the little bitternesses that develop and the little dynamics that develop where we just let people get under our skin somehow. That when we fall and we avoid being with that pain, we allow it to root and we allow it to fuel and we find ourselves living out of that defensiveness and bitterness that arises simply from what Richard Rohr calls the unknowing. Richard Rohr suggests it's difficult for us, especially when we spend most of our lives, as we've talked about in that first half of our life, where it's all about controlling, where it's all about establishing, where it's all about defining ourselves. In the first half of life, the world is a lot like Shakespeare said, right? Do you remember the quote, all the world is a stage and we're merely players on it? It's a very dualistic way of looking at the world. But it's also the way that a lot of us live our lives. We find ourselves sort of living out life in a way that either has been sort of a destiny for us, or perhaps a part of our family history, or perhaps a self-made direction. And nonetheless, though, we still define ourselves in contrast to others. We define ourselves in how we establish our ultimate identity and make our way. But then Richard Rohr says, that that dualistic way, which is not a bad way, by the way. It's interesting if you get to the end of the book. I'm not sure how many of you are reading the book, but when you get to the end, it's amazing how all of this starts to make sense. We need dualistic thinking. We definitely need ways of somehow defining ourselves against an issue or figuring out how to resolve something. But at the same time, if we don't allow ourselves to see the connections, if we don't engage this understanding of things as interconnected, then what happens is, is we get trapped in dualistic thinking. We never get out of this small-mindedness. We never see the bigger picture. We continue to live out of patterns because that's dualistic living. We end up in patterns, like a stage, and we play our parts. So that when we suddenly fall on our faces, or we screw up, or we're the victims of a disease, there is no healthy ending. 
Now, that's not to say that doctors can't provide a, a cure. But there's no ultimate healthy ending to that. And for many people, that doesn't seem to be a reason, right? There doesn't seem to be a reason for that mystery, for that suffering. And Richard Rohr says it's because that's where we need to move beyond. And as Marion mentioned in her book, as Brene Brown says in her book, that's the one place where we are suddenly invited into a greater mystery. I hope you read the text. I'm going to try practicing this. I know that I was, I was with Charm uh, Robarts in Disciple Church, and I know that they put their text in the top of the bulletin, and then just they never read it. It's kind of assumed that you'll read it. I, I thought maybe we'll try that and just see if you read the text. So um, now I'm looking at you, and you're all going like, oh, I didn't read the text there. I saw that. I didn't know that. I figured somebody else will do that for me. Yeah. But if you'll read that text, it's amazing, this idea from, from Isaiah the, this, this, this lamenting, where is God in the midst of our travails? Where is God when we're having these conflicts and problems? And as the text says, don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts. God is creator of all you see. God doesn't tire or pause to catch a breath. The holy of all energizes those who get tired and strengthens the dropouts. Um, and then I love this last line, but those who wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. Richard Rohr argues in his book that when we learn to see the world not as separate, but as all connected, that we live in the midst of God's reality and God lives in the midst of our lives, that we are connected to one another in profound ways we begin seeing our relationships differently. He calls it a second naivete because it literally changes the way we view the world. The world is now larger. It's wholly interconnected. Mystery empowers us with a deeper joy and a sense of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. But he argues, and this was the hard part. I've mentioned this several times in this series, and I know I've gotten feedback from folks too. This is the hard part. He argues that in reality, ultimately, sometimes the only way to get to second sight, to get to that second naivete, is through the suffering. The only way to face that way of seeing the world larger is to face suffering. A friend of mine I've mentioned in here, Michael Goldstein, is a, uh, he was a clown, but he, he really called himself a fool, and he worked with kids in cancer, at, at cancer uh, hospitals, kids with cancer, as well as camps for kids, pediatric oncology camps, and he called himself Mickle the Pickle, but after years, he changed it because that didn't really say what he was all about. In fact, it said sometimes the wrong thing, and so he changed his name to the Sheriff of Fun, and whenever he went in, he enforced fun. <laughs> that was kind of his role. And, and, and I actually got an email from, from Michael recently, Michael Goldstein, because um, he, he, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, was diagnosed a few months back with uh, four, fourth stage non-Hodgkin's cancer. And, and we've been emailing back and forth a little bit, and, and he's shared with me sort of what this has been about for him, because there's a sense of irony in it as well, that he spent his life working with children with cancer and then contracts the disease himself. And he said he likened it to being with the trapeze artists that we used to work with. I don't know, was there ever there when you were there at that camp, the circus? They were there twice? Yeah, and, and it's amazing. They brought in a circus, and they brought in a trapeze artist, and they set up the trapeze that's about 25, 30 feet above the ground with a net about six feet off the ground. And, and then the, everyone, the kids would line up, and anybody willing to do that as well as the adults you got this experience. The, the strange experience, of course, is that you did it, right? You, you got up and did it. Of course, I did. Of course you did it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to risk leaping from 30 feet up in the air. Are you kidding? The challenging thing about it is, is that if you've ever watched, you have to lean out to grab the, 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 uh, the, the swing. Now, it'll be tied up. The person who landed there will tie it up to the edge, and it's kind of st standing at an angle because you can only grab it with one hand and stay balanced. If you grab it with two hands, you are off balance. When you grab with the second hand, you have committed to the fall. You've committed to it. And it's a strange reality because you, the first time, maybe even the second time, I've done it a few times, but as you're holding that, you have this strange sensation of which you are literally saying, I'm going to lean out and fall. 
And it's not just a matter of trusting. There's this anxiety that just is hard to define, right? That, that it, you're the one holding. There's no other cable holding you. You're just holding on to it. And you're going to swing out there. And some of us actually got to swing out and do a flip because we'd already swung out and landed. And so we kind of pushed our, ourselves. But um, as, as you're doing it, you're looking down. And he said when he did it the first time, he was looking down and he saw the kids looking up going, you know, you can do it, Mickle. you can do it, Mickle. And, and he was looking down, feeling this courage, right? And the kid's encouraging him. But he said something interesting happened to him that he discovered now that he's having cancer. He said, I noticed that they were mirroring my anxiety. But at the same time, some of them were mirroring not courage. They weren't saying just you can do it. He looked at the, at, the, uh, at the trapeze artist himself, and he looked at some of the others who had done it, and their smile was one which said, you won't believe what this is like. You can't imagine. It was like an invitation. He said they were mirroring something completely different, and he said it overwhelmed him so that he realized he needed to do the same thing because those kids were looking at him with the you can do it, but they weren't seeing the invitation. And so he began to smile with this sense of playfulness that he was characteristic of. And he reached out, grabbed it, and let go and swung in the air. And then he said as soon as he got up in the air, he didn't do a flip. It was awkward. He twirled up and landed flat on his back and bounced up and down on his back. And, of course, it looked funny because, you know, your butt comes up in the air, and then everybody's laughing and everybody's cheering. He said, Tom, when he was telling me about this, he said, the thrill was not in flying. The thrill was in letting go. The thrill was that strange moment when I was suddenly not aware. I just reached, and I let go. The consequence was, you know, I looked like a total idiot because I landed, and it was all awkward and got tangled up in the net, and everybody had a good laugh. But it was that moment where everything seemed the same. I wrote in my blog this past week that um, I got on my bicycle for the first time. I don't know how many of you read that. You can go back and check about the bicycle accident. I can pull down my arm, but I don't want to disgust you. There's a nice big old scar right here. And, um, and there's a bruise on my hip, and I won't show you that. But, um, but I'm okay. I'm okay. You can read about the accident. What was interesting was that after I got back on the bike and I rode to the park, I had this wonderful experience of seeing a couple of birds. And, and it, was a, it was like an elderly bird, like maybe the mama bird, the papa bird. It was a blue jay, and then, the, then another little bird in the nest. And they were calling back and forth, and it was very clear that this one had been trying to get that one to leave its nest. And what I realized was that, that this one was just, it wasn't going to do it. It was just as if it's saying, like, I know I'm supposed to. Birds fly. I'm not going out there. And this other one's saying, like, you don't know what's out there. You don't know what's waiting for you. It's amazing. If you just open your wings, reality is waiting for you to just open your wings. It's going to receive you. But again, the bird wasn't going to do it. And it, and it, it suddenly happened. It was like this moment, right? It's not the moment when I decide, now I'm going to take a risk. Think about when you've done something that was risky. Think about a time when you finally faced something that you refused to face. Maybe it was in a counseling session. Maybe it was with a friend you were talking with. Maybe it was on a retreat on your own. But some, at some point, you faced something that you just didn't think you could face. That's that strange moment, that mysterious moment where I believe God is in our midst, where everything seems to be one and the same, all things the same side of a single coin, the teacher, the student, the parent, the child, the resistance and the invitation, the fear and the excitement, all of that seems to somehow become one. And that's when I looked up and the bird just jumped out of nowhere. It wasn't chirping. It wasn't doing anything. It jumped. And, of course, it fluttered and it almost fell and it landed on a lower branch. And then literally it was kind of hysterical because the bird kind of shook its head like, what just happened? And then it looked back and looked back at the bird. And, then, and I didn't stick around, but it flapped its wings a couple of times and I figured it's probably going to do it again. But that first time. Richard Rohr says that when we experience this sense of darkness, this sense of, of abandonment, the holy in our midst is always inviting and sometimes the only way to get there 
if no one's there to mirror it for us, is to just trust with curiosity. Brene Brown, engage it. Wrestle with it. Run toward it. And as we enter into it, we discover something. We discover that at acknowledging our pain, at the edge of that, without doubt, but instead without, with curiosity and without judgment, which is something I think we sometimes can practice in our relationships, in our staff, as well as on our road, in our relationships and with, with each other. Instead, engage with this curious empathy. I wonder how you are really a lot like me. Or I wonder how I'm really a lot like you. Or that thing that you do that I don't like is probably because there's something about me that I don't like. When we can begin to enter into our shadows with curiosity, Richard Rohr says we've already stepped into the bigger picture, the place where God is awaiting to transform our fear into joy. Amen. On stepping, stepping, stepping into the future. Time keeps on stepping, stepping, stepping into the future. I wanna fly like an eagle to the sea. Fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me. I want to. Till I'm free Oh, oh, till the revolution Feed the babies Don't have enough to eat Shoe the children With no shoes on the feet House of people Living in the streets Oh, there's a solution See To eat, shoe the children with those shoes on the feet. House of people that are living in the streets. I know there's a solution. I want to fly like an eagle to the sea. Fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me. I want to fly like an eagle. Till I'm free oh, oh, to the revolution I want to fly, 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 fly yeah. I want to fly, 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 fly I want to fly, 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 fly I want to fly, 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 fly. Time keeps on spinning 
spin, spin into the future. stand for our blessing, and uh, they're going to, you guys going to play that chorus for a little while yeah. afterwards? Yeah, so y'all stick around, we can sing that as you want, or just walk out as you're singing it, <laughs> fly like an eagle, um, and, and let's take one another's hands. I invite you this week, as, as, you're, as you're thinking about all of this, uh, I invite you also to pursue uh, one, of the, one of the book study groups and get a little deeper into this. It's a fascinating book, um, but as you're moving about this week, it's, it's, it can be a real challenge to try to see ourselves in one another and to try to face those, um, those folks with whom we hold resentments or those situations where we find ourselves being impatient or even ourselves with whom we hold our own sense of shame. It's difficult, I think. So the invitation, of course, is to just let that be and to approach it with some curiosity, to kind of play with it. Allow yourself permission to literally play with what sometimes frightens us. And I believe the promise is, is on the other side of that is a strange and powerful transformation that in, invites us to a deeper joy. Let's pray. Holy One, as we move from this place, we move in your being, we live in your being, we, we experience our sense of disconnection in the midst of your being. Remind us with the slightest little moments, catch our attention that we might not be looking away and running away, but that we might be engaging in the midst of the moment and finding something profound. Bless us as we leave this place. We pray in the name of the one in whom we move and live and have our being. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Spin, spin, spin into the future. Time keeps on spin, spin, spin into the future. Time keeps on spin, spin, spin into the future. Spin, spin, spin into the future.
never known to be Sure that you're brown Baby, on the street House of people Baby, out in the street Oh, oh, there's a solution On to fly Till I'm free Oh, oh, there's a solution Tick, tock, tick Tick, tock, tick Tick, tock, tick Chances. I'm on the distance and I'm not gonna stop. Just a man and his will to survive. 